Simulation of a Tracked Vehicle for Use in Automated Mine Inspection by Michael Rock, myself. What we have here is an image of a tracked vehicle with an articulated arm on top of it. My experiment will be done on a similar vehicle, which is tracked. However, instead of having an articulated arm like this one, it has a telescoping arm that can simply just go up and down. The reason I don't have an image for it is it has not been built yet, and therefore I do not have any images that can represent it, but this is a very similar robot and can give me an idea of what it will look like. So the inspiration for this work is from Cameco's uranium mining facility, where they use underground drift mines in order to extract uranium ore. What you can see here is the end of a tunnel and the face that you can see with the grid spray painted onto it is called a drift face. The way they extract ore is by drilling into this face, blasting the rock, and removing the broken rock which is rich with uranium ore. At each step, when they blast it out, they have to spray the walls with shotcrete in order to prevent any rocks from falling down and harming the workers. Well, the problem with spraying it with shotcrete is you can no longer measure the uranium levels of the drift face once it's been sprayed with shotcrete. So currently, the way the operators have to measure the uranium levels is actually with long um, sensors, and they can stand a far enough distance away in a part of the tunnel that has been sprayed with shotcrete and measure the uranium levels on the drift face. Why do you want to measure the uranium levels? Well, the vein isn't guaranteed to be perfectly horizontal. So you need to know where this vein of uranium ore is in order to decide which direction to continue the drift so that you can extract the maximum amount of uranium and be sure that you are following along the uranium vein. So what will my robot do? Well, my robot, since it is a robot and not a person, it can go into areas that are potentially unsafe for people where rocks may fall down. And so we can send this robot in to inspect the drift, drift face before it's been sprayed with shotcrete. And it can expect, inspect it very closely and we can use a shielded uranium sensor so that we can inspect very small areas of the drift face and get a very accurate reading of where the uranium ore exists. So that's what my solution that I'm proposed. Uh, we use automated inspection, which is the robot similar to the one that I showed you on the first slide. The shielded sensors so that we can detect exactly where the uranium ore is. Um, we've chosen a tracked vehicle because it is more stable in an underground mining environment. And we'll use a telescopic sensor that can go up and down so that the robot can or move the, the radiation sensor up and down the wall and the vehicle can drive along the wall in order to cover the entire surface of the drift face. So the first thing that we had to come up with was a vehicle model and you may recognize this image from our course assignments where we have a tracked vehicle with an offset. In this case it was a drill but in my case it is the telescoping uranium sensor. And in order to come up with this model we have this equation down here that represents the vehicle. To find our new state variables we have ZD which is equal to our X desired, Y desired, Z desired, our desired velocity in the X direction which is VR plus VL over 2 times cos theta d, and our desired velocity in the y direction, and finally our desired velocity in the z direction. And then we need to define our new state variables, which is shown below. And in order to control them, we introduce our new control law, which is eta equals k times our z desired minus z. So in order to select k, we use our MATLAB place function, and since we are operating in discrete time, we must have all of our poles within the unit circle. This is the output that our tracking 
gives us. So we have our eta1, eta2, and eta3, which is our new control. And when we multiply that by our vehicle model, shown here, we can then calculate what our rate of change of x, y, z, and theta is. And in order to find what the actual single step change of x, y, z, and theta are, we can figure that out in discrete time by multiplying our rate of change times capital T, which is the time step. So the next step that we need to do is create an extended Kalman filter in order to actually track we, where our vehicle thinks it is. So we start with our discrete time model. So our vehicle model, um, we have our input u of k from the previous slide, which is our velocity of the left track, velocity of the right track, and the velocity of the telescopic sensor. And we have our noise, which is Gaussian white noise. So the measurement model, um, what we have is we're simulating a laser tracking system, which works very similar to a GPS. So the laser tracking system will be mounted at a fixed location, and then it will just track the vehicle. And it will return us the X, the Y, and the Z of the vehicle. Um, it's a linear system, as you can see from our C matrix over here, and once again, our noise is uh, white Gaussian noise, and it's uh, defined over here on the bottom right. So we need to compute our Jacobians, and uh, that's this is for our uh, predictive step over here. Then, so for our predictive step, once we've computed our Jacobians, it's simply um, inputting the information into these formulas and we can calculate what our covariance matrix, capital P, and our um, predictive step is, which is uh, this Q hat over here, what we think our position is. Then we do our corrective step. So once we ran all of that through MATLAB, which we will get to shortly, um, we have our various outputs. So what you can see here is the tracking. So the red line is the desired location and the blue line is the actual vehicle location. So the first one you can see um, along the x-axis, it's approaching and it eventually gets to the location it wants to be, but it takes a little too long to get there. Um, this can be improved by modifying the gains in our K matrix of our tracker, but they must remain inside the unit circle. So we've we've maximized them to as high as they can go. You, if you look, you'll see there negative one. Um, along the Y axis, it tracks a bit better. Um, and along the Z axis, you see it it tries to track, but it's a little delayed, and it's also not as accurate as we would like to be. Now. Why have we picked these desired coordinates? Well, all we really want to do is we want to drive up to the wall, go along the drift face, and as we go along the drift face, we want to have the telescopic sensor going up and down so that we get a, essentially a zigzag pattern across the drift face. And from that pattern, we can take uh, radiation measurements through our uranium, well, our radiation sensor, and based on those uh, measurements, we can estimate where the uranium vein is. And then finally, the we want to track and, and keep our orientation parallel to the wall so that it will hold our sensor as close to the wall as possible so that we can get the most accurate readings. And you see, um, we started off facing towards the wall and, and we want to be parallel to the wall, so it first has to go our orientation first has to go further away from our desired orientation in order for it to drive towards the wall and then eventually it approaches the desired orientation. Here's our estimation um, and you can see it, it, it converges quite quickly because we have our GPS system. Um, the first error is the estimation in the X, second error is estimation in the Y, third error is the estimation in the Z and the final one is the estimation 
of orientation. And this is our final output graph. Um, the red line is the desired, the, the essentially the drift wall. So we want to go along that wall. Um, the blue line is where the vehicle is actually driving using our tracker. And so you can see it starts away from the wall and it, and it goes towards the wall and then goes along the wall. And then the green line is our Kalman filter that estimates the position. So let's take a moment and we'll go to the MATLAB code and we'll be able to inspect that a little more closely. Okay, so here we have our MATLAB code. And the first thing we need to do is set up our simulation parameters. So we start off by setting our simulation time, our sample time for our discrete processes, our initial robot configuration, our robot physical parameters, so L is the distance between the wheels or the tracks, B is the distance to the sensor from the center of the robot, and R is the diameter of the wheels. And then we can compute the number of simulation steps we have to do. We create some entry empty matrices for speed, and then we set up our initial parameters for our EKF. So our initial position, and then our initial guess, which is slightly off from our initial position, our initial covariance estimate, and then we set our, our noise matrices. So here's where the simulation begins. And the first thing we need to do is we need to just um, create our initial information. So essentially we run through the tracker and the EKF. Um, this is purely for the tracker, but the tracker needs to be ran through once with initialization information. And then from then on, it can continue on because it, can, it always references the previous step in order to calculate how much it's moved. So we need to just run it through once without um, referencing the previous step so that it can it can track. So we start off, um, we set the desired pose, and then we run our tracker, and then we calculate what our control inputs are, and then we add noise to those control inputs. Um, we run our sensor in order to get our localization information, and then we pass that to, to the EKF. So we'll talk about those steps um, right over here. So this loop over here is where we actually run the simulation. The first one was just the first step. So the first thing we do is we generate our desired pose. And so we know we always want to be um, at 50 in, in the X and then our Y. This is our desired Y location, our desired Z position, and then our desired orientation. And then we generate um, desired speeds, so the velocity of our right wheel, our left wheel, and the desired velocity of the radiation sensor. So now the first thing we do is run our tracker. Um, now, as you saw from the slides, the EKF position estimator was just not accurate enough um, and it wasn't really tracking where the vehicle was properly but what we should do is replace this with Q hat once our estimator is working. What, when we do that um, what we're doing is rather than giving it the actual position we can now add noise to the actual position which simulates slip in the wheels and our tracker will track based on Q hat, which is where our EKF estimates that the vehicle is. So if we were to replace this X over here with a Q hat, then um, any sort of wheel slip would be compensated for um, through our EKF, and our mm -hmm. tracker would use our most accurate um, estimate of where the position is rather than um, this X, which is essentially dead reckoning. Um, so if we were to add some noise to the X, it would simulate slip, and this system is set up in order to be robust to slippage, um, but our EKF is just not accurate enough to trust the EKF data. Um, so this is where we run through our tracker, and we pass the tracker um, our desired X, our desired velocities, um, L and B are the configurations of the robots, I is the iteration, T steps is the total number of iterations, um, and then we pass it our previous position so that it can calculate what the new position is, which is this over here, um, and T, which is the time step. So let's take a moment right here to look at what our function tracker does. 
So we initialize, um, we have our persistent variables, which dx is our velocities. Um, and then, as you remember from the slides, there is our state, our new state variables. So our new desired, z desired, is our desired x, y, z, and then our desired x, y, and z velocities, x dot, y dot, and z dot. We have our feedback linearized model matrices, and then we define our new state variables, so our current position. Um, so x1, x2, x3 is our x, y, and z. Um, x4 is our orientation, so um, our x, and x5 and x6 is our velocity relative to the robot, so it's just forward velocity, and 6 is the velocity of the telescopic sensor. Um, so we choose our linear gains, so these must be within the unit circle because we're running in discrete time, and then we place our poles and we compute our new in input control signal. So um, finally we get these dx's which is the velocity of our x, our y, our theta, and our z um, based on our new controls eta1, eta2, and eta3. And and so once we want to calculate what our new x position should be, we multiply our velocity times our time step, and then we add it to our previous position, and we can calculate what our new output is. So back to our simulation. Um, so then based on the difference between our current position and our previous position over the time step, um, we can calculate how much it's moved, so what our control inputs were. So that's where we find out what U1, U2, and U3 is. Those are our control inputs. And then our sensors um, have noise to them, so we add a little bit of noise to our sensors. And then we use our, our localization sensor um, to give us ZM, which is the estimate of where the position is and this sensor adds in a little bit of noise into it that's why we're passing it this this matrix R so we can add the noise to our localization and then we run our, our Kalman filter and we pass it the measured inputs and the measured position as well as our covariance matrices and then these are for initialization and we give it as time step and then some robot configuration parameters so when we take a look at our extended Kalman filter, we can see over here um, that we've got our PMEM and QMEM, which is this PMEM is our covariance matrix, and QMEM is our Q hat, which is our position estimate. Um, so we do our predictive step over here, and you can see where it sets the new um, covariance matrix and prediction. And then we can do our corrective step and this is where we use our Z over here, which is the localization data, in order to come up with a more accurate estimate of our position, as well as how confident we are with this estimation. And then finally, we go back to our simulation. And once we've done, we ran through our whole simulation, we can plot the outputs. So we can plot first the actual position versus the desired position for our tracking. And then we can plot to see how good our our Kalman filter is, where we plot the error and the confidence. And finally we make a movie of our of our system working. So in one moment I will play the video for you and you will see how it runs. Okay, so what you see here is the red line which is the desired position, our little blue robot, and the blue line, which is where its actual position is, and then the green line shows where the EKF thinks it is. Okay, so I'd like to thank you for your time and for watching my presentation.